When it comes to romantic relationships, I think we all have pretty much the same goal. We all want, if we're in a relationship, to stay in love. We all want to be happy together forever. That's the goal, isn't it? It's a goal whether you're Christian, it's a goal whether you're not Christian. We all pretty much have the same dream. Uh, that's a dream for all of us, but it's happening less and less around us. And I feel like as we start, it's probably important just to point out that when it comes to relationships, if you do what everyone else does, you will get what everyone else has. And the reality is most of us, when we look around, we don't necessarily want what everybody else has, but without realizing it, or maybe because we don't know any better, we are doing what everybody else does. And so this series is designed to give you a different way, a better way to think about relationships. We're going to talk about three counterintuitive principles. Uh, I refer to them sometimes as secrets, not because there's something profound about them, but because nobody does them. So it's like they're secrets, you know, but here's three things that if you do this, if you practice these, it will make a profound difference in your ability to be with someone happy together forever. So these are principles. If you are here and you're married, you can go home and start practicing these immediately. It will make a difference. Uh, these are principles that if you're not married, but you hope to be married or to be married again at some point, you can actually start practicing these now and developing these skills so that when you do get married, it'll go better. You know, it'll be better. You'll be happier together forever. And for those of you in the room who are like, I don't want anything to do with marriage, I understand. That's fine. You can actually take these principles and apply them to any relationship. They are universal. So you pick any relationship you hope is healthier or stronger. You start doing this. It is going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference. And the reality is, I don't have to convince you of this. We could all use a little help, couldn't we? Because relationships are hard. Every kind of relationship is hard. But marriage is really hard. It is. And the reason marriage is really hard is because when two people get married, you're taking two independent individuals who have independent routines, independent habits, independent decision making, and suddenly you're bringing them together and you're saying, okay, now I want you to be two interdependent people with interdependent routines, habits, and decisions. Now, what could possibly go wrong with that, right? It's like, well, of course there's going to be some friction. Of course it's going to be hard. That's just part of it. As I was preparing for this, I almost actually wrote the statement, um, nothing reveals selfishness in a person more than marriage. And then I realized that's not true. Kids are worse. They are. Yes, yeah, so you know that, don't you? But then, but then the kids come and it puts all the pressure back on the marriage. So anyway, it all is a cycle. But it does. It brings out when you get married... It reveals how much selfishness is in you or in me that we didn't even realize was there because we were independent. So nobody was rubbing up against that. Nobody was creating any friction there, which is why it's always interesting to me. And just because of my line of work, I have a lot of these conversations. It's interesting to me when people come in to want to talk about uh, their marriage to get some quote unquote counseling. And they say, oh my gosh, my marriage is just so hard. You know, if I feel like if I'd met the right one, it wouldn't be this hard. And I've stopped being diplomatic. I just start laughing when they say that. I'm like, I don't care which one you meet. It's going to be hard no matter what. Granted, your one might be making it harder than it should. But nonetheless, it's hard no matter what. Marriage is supposed to be really hard because of what you're trying to create as you're bringing two independent people together. So if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know if I've done it right or if I've you know, married the right person because it's so hard. Nope. Welcome to the club. All right. It's hard for all of us. So what I want to do over the next three weeks is we're going to talk about three of these counterintuitive principles that will help you navigate all the difficulty, which is normal, navigate all the difficulty in a marriage relationship and come out on the other side, more in love, come out on the other side, happy together forever. And all three of these principles were taught by Jesus, which by the way, if you're sitting there and you're skeptical, and maybe you should be, you're skeptical going, why would I take any marriage advice from Jesus? He didn't have one. You know, he was never married. Why would I listen to him on that? That's a great question. And since the theme is counterintuitive, this morning I'm going to let another single guy from the first century explain to you and to me why we should actually listen to Jesus when it comes to marriage advice. But before we read what Paul wrote and what he had to say, I need to remind you, this is really important, so dial in here for a second. I, I need to remind you of the context and the culture in which Paul wrote the words that we're about to read. It was nothing like ours today. Uh, Paul was writing, in this case, to Christians in the city of Ephesus, but in a culture and to a group of people living in a culture and a context where 
well, the best way to put it is women were often just treated as property. So relationships didn't work the way, you know, they work now. Women were often looked at as property. And this was across the board. As a matter of fact, this is a common, it's recorded in history. This is a common prayer that Jewish men often prayed when they woke up in the morning. They would pray, God, I thank you. I'm not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. It's like a little harsh. Wouldn't you say? It's, Gentlemen, if you're really brave, just get up and pray this at breakfast in the morning. See what happens. You know, you're smarter than that, aren't you? But it tells you a little bit about the culture. These men would pray this and not think twice about it. You know, um, it wasn't just the Jews. I'm not picking on the Jewish culture. Uh, when you look at the Greek culture of the first century, it was the same way, actually worse. Uh, maybe you've heard of the Greek statesman Demosthenes. Uh, Demosthenes put into writing these words. Here's what he wrote. He said, we have courtesans for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. And we have wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and being faithful guardians of our household affairs. Like, nobody looked at Demosthenes and said, that's not going to age well. You shouldn't put that on paper, you know. Because it was just normal. It was accepted. He didn't think twice about writing this down. Yeah, what are your wives are for? Uh, so we can have some legitimate children because we have plenty of illegitimate. And oh yeah, they, we need somebody who watches the house and makes sure everything, you know. It's like, how insulting can you be? But that was the kind of culture and context and mindset into which Paul wrote these words, which, you know, for us, we interpret them very differently than we would have if we'd have been in the first century. Paul wrote to the Christians in Ephesus, and he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. All right, so he says, listen, you're living in a culture where there is no mutual submission. You're living in a culture where everybody's trying to get ahead. He says, I, I want you to submit to one another, to which you know the people that, you know, whoever stood up in church and read this letter, you, you know everybody in the room had to be like, are you kidding me? You know, the women had to be like, Submit to him. He treats me like I'm not submit. You know, I'm not submitting. Now I already have to do too much. And the men were like, "Submit to her. Why would I do that? I've got the upper hand." You know, this was the culture they were living in. Submit just means I'm going to put the emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental needs of the other person ahead of myself. That's what Paul was challenging them to do. You got to remember, Paul never when he wrote these words. He wasn't thinking about us. He had no idea that 2,000 years later we'd still be reading his words. He's just talking to them, which means, as you could imagine, he knew they were having some problems with this. This was so countercultural. They couldn't figure out how to do it. And he says, no, no, no. I know what everybody around you is doing. I, I know what's normal in relationships. And Paul's going, if you're a Jesus follower, you've got to do something so countercultural. You have to submit to one another, which is why if you're here and you're not a Christian, couldn't have picked a better day to come because all of this is optional for you. Congratulations. The rest of us who are Christians have to at least wrestle with we're supposed to be doing it, you know, even if we don't. And this was Paul's point. He's like, no, no, you need to submit to each other. If you're following Jesus, this is how you treat one another. And you do it not out of reverence for each other, not because the other person deserves it. He said you do it out of reverence for Jesus. That's why you do it. Now, this is important because if there were a way, and this is how Paul viewed it, if there were a way for you to have like a physical conversation with God who's sitting across the table from you. And you said, God, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for all the forgiveness you show me unreservedly, all the love you give me unconditionally, all the acceptance that you give me. God, I'm, I'm just so thankful for everything you've done to me. God, I just want to know how can, I, how can I express my gratitude? How can I say thank you to you, God? Do you know what God would say to you? According to Paul. God would not look at you and say, well, here's a list of things to do. Actually, God would look at you and say, well, there's, there's nothing you can do for me. Don't worry about that. There's nothing you can do for me. If you want to show gratitude to me, I want you to treat the people in your life like I've treated you. You want to show gratitude to me, God says, and you, you love the people around you the way I have loved you, which is why Paul starts with this principle. You got to submit to one another and not out of reverence for each other. You do it out of gratitude and reverence for what Jesus has done for you. And then Paul gets very specific about what this looks like in a marriage relationship. And the reason I think he does is because for those of us who follow Jesus, 
it's got to start there. Like we have, to, we have to figure out how to exercise and demonstrate and live out this principle right there with the person we're closest to and then begin to do it with everybody else around us. So Paul starts with you ladies. He says, wives, I want you to submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So all the ladies who are in the room, he's thinking, okay, you, you need to start putting him first the way Jesus has put you first. To which I'm sure these ladies are thinking, are you kidding me? Do you not know how he treats me? I mean, half the time I don't have rights. Half the time I'm treated like I'm property. I'm not submitting to him, you know. And some of you ladies may be thinking the same thing. Like, if you only knew, you know, what I'm dealing with here. You wouldn't tell me to submit, which I totally understand. But I would just ask you ladies two questions, and they're probably not nice questions, so I'm very sorry. But I want to ask you two questions if you find yourself resisting this. The first question is, um, who picked him? I'm going to give that a second. Yeah, yeah, I knew. It's like, oh, yeah. You pick, I mean, at least in the first century, those women could go, my parents picked him. It was a prearranged marriage. You know, I didn't have a say. No, no, no. You pick, I know it was a weak moment for you. I know you weren't thinking clearly. But you said yes, okay? That was of your own free will. You said yes. So we'll move on. Anyway, that's, that's part of it you have to remember. And the other part you have to remember is, I mean, were you, were you so perfect and deserving when Jesus chose to submit and offer you unconditional love? I mean, were you, were you so perfect and deserving when he chose to do that for you? Well, of course not. So this is Paul's point. Like, you... You submit, you put the, your husband before yourself, not because he deserves it, but because that's what Jesus chose to do for you. And then, and then Paul writes some words that are so controversial now, but they were not controversial at all then. As a matter of fact, I think if he were here today, he'd be like, y'all did what with, my, with that sentence? Are you kidding me? You know, Because this just meant something totally different then. Than it does now. But it's super controversial. Now, so controversial, I considered standing behind the TV as I read them. But I thought that might not be enough, so I have security backstage in case I need to be ushered out, okay? Here's, here's what he wrote. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church's body, of which he's the Savior. Now, this is the irony of this sentence. The irony of this sentence is it has been so misconstrued, misinterpreted, used and abused by Christian men. This is a whole irony. If anybody ought to understand what Paul is getting at here, it ought to be those of us who follow Jesus. But we're the ones who misuse it. And in my experience, those of you who are husbands who are not Christians, you understand exactly what this means. It's just ironic. Because the point Paul is making, he is not giving us guys a I am the boss card. That's not what this is. It's not like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're the head of your wife. Oh, you got to do whatever I say. I'm the boss. So you heard him. You know, you got to follow my, whatever. That's not what he's saying. No, no, no. He says, you're, you're the head just like Jesus is head of the church. Well, what did, what did Jesus do as head of the church? I mean, Jesus in his relationship with us did not come down, and he could have. He had every right to, but he didn't show up on earth and go, I'm the boss. I'm in charge. You people all should do what I say, and he had every right to. No, no, what did he do? He came down and he said, I'm going to choose humility and I'm going to serve you. I'm not trying to be the boss. I'm trying to be the greatest servant of all. So this is not an, oh, I'm first card. This is actually an I'm last card. This is what Paul's trying to communicate to all of us guys. He's going, okay, no, no. In, in a marriage relationship, you're last. You're putting her first. You're last. So he's looking at the women going, you you put him first because he's already put you first. You, you put him first, and you don't have anything to worry about because he's last in this relationship. He's not first. That's exactly what Paul was saying, which is why he had no, point, or no problem going on in writing. Now, as the church submits to Christ, wives should submit to their husbands in everything, in everything. Paul, it seems a little extreme. You know, It's like, what's going to happen? Paul's going, no, no. If he's putting you first the way he should be putting you first, then he's last and you're first. So there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to fear. You can, you can put him before you and everything because you know he's going to put you before him. He's never going to take advantage of that. But we don't see that very much anymore, do we? So he gives the wives this application of how to submit to one another in a marriage relationship. And then he turns around and 
puts a spotlight on his husbands, and he gives us some very direct advice. He says, uh, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, present her by himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless to which all of you women go. Are you kidding me, Paul? You got four words out and you started rambling. That's what that sounds like, doesn't it? It's like four words for the husband and then what is all that stuff about? But he is not rambling. Paul is actually anchoring the advice that he's giving. So let me see if I can explain this where it makes sense and it's not confusing. This is why, according to Paul, we should all listen to Jesus when it comes to marriage advice, even though Jesus wasn't married. Because Paul is alluding to something that's talked about in both the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament. The fact that God created marriage to be a reflection or a, a tangible expression of his relationship with us. That's why he created marriage. In other words, when you see a marriage relationship where, where two people are loving each other unconditionally, submitting to one another, putting the other before themselves, Paul goes, okay, that is a great picture of the relationship between Jesus and his sons or daughters. It's a great relationship between, or picture of the relationship between Jesus and us. Marriage is just to be a, a tangible earthly reflection of the kind of relationship that he's chosen to have with us and he wants us to have with him. So he's not letting husbands off the hook with, hey, go love your wives, you're done. No, no, no. He's just anchoring his advice to a bar, to a standard that is so high He's going, guys, let me define what love looks like for you. Because ladies, as you know, we can be really good at defining things in our own terms. So he says, I'm not going to let you do that. Your job is to love her like Jesus loves you. There's your standard. You treat her the way Jesus treats us. That's all you got to do. Bar sky high. He says, if you'll do that, well, then she'll submit and treat you as if Jesus treats her and puts you before her like you put her before you. And next thing you know, you got a relationship that's totally secure, built on unconditional love. This is what Paul's alluding to, which is why he gives this advice to husbands. He says, in this same way, in the same way Jesus you know, relates to us, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. You remember Jesus was asked one time, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, well, love God, but there are two and they're the same thing. You should love God and you should love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Paul's alluding to here. He's going, hey guys, your responsibility is to love your neighbor as yourself and your neighbor starts with your wife. So why don't you start loving her the way you love you? Now, here's why I think this is valuable. Because you hear people talk sometimes and they'll use terms like a Christian marriage, you know, or Jesus followers marriage, whatever term they want to use. And they define that in some different ways. Do you know what the distinguishing mark or the primary characteristic is, if you will, of a Christian marriage? Well, let me tell you what's not, okay? A Christian marriage is not a marriage where two Christians just manage to stay married and not get divorced. That's not Christian marriage. There are plenty of people who stay married, don't get divorced, but they don't love each other this way. They just tolerate each other. A Christian marriage is not a marriage where two people decide, oh yeah, we're going to stay married and we're going to have our family in church every Sunday and make sure our kids are here and on and on and on. Now that's all great and that's helpful. I'm not knocking that obviously, but that's not a Christian marriage because we could point to plenty of examples of families who showed up to church on Sundays and the kids heard all about love, but when they went home, they didn't see it demonstrated between mom and dad. That's not a Christian marriage. According to Paul and according to Jesus, you know what a Christian marriage is? It is a marriage that is marked or defined by the kind of love that we just read about. And you know what that love looks like in a marriage? It looks like mutual submission. This is your characteristic. This is your number one quality of a Christian marriage is mutual submission. It is two people going, I'm going to try to always put you before myself. Now, we grew up being told competition is not good for relationships, but that's not entirely true because this kind of competition is great for relationships. So all you people who are like me and you're competitively driven, all right, well, here's your thing, okay? Here's your thing. Your job in a marriage is to do everything you can to outsubmit the other person. That's your job. 
that, oh my gosh, she did it again. I'm going to go do something else to outsubmit her. You know, it's like, I, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm not going to let her one-up me. I'm going to put her before me more than she puts me before her and vice versa. This is what a Christian marriage is supposed to look like. Two people who almost get to the point of being ridiculous going, you first, no, you first, no, you first, no, you first, you know? It's like, where do you want to eat? No, where do you want to eat? Now, back and forth you go. Where do you want vacation? No, where do you, it's, that's what it looks like. Two people who are always trying to think of and respect and defer to the needs of the other person before themselves. You want to have a Christian marriage, that's the foundation of it right here. And so the first counterintuitive principle to a relationship where you're going to be happy together forever is simple. You just make your marriage a submission competition. That's it. Just decide we're going to compete, but we're going to compete about out, you know, submitting to one another. I'm going to, I'm going to be nicer to you than you are to me. I'm going to defer to you more than you defer to me. I'm going to make more of your dreams come true than you make of mine come true. Now, if you find yourself resisting that idea, and I get it because this is not natural for any of us, here's what I would say to you. Imagine that you were in a relationship with someone, you were in a marriage with someone, where this was true of them, where this is the approach they took. Imagine you were in a marriage with a spouse who you never had to wonder if they were going to be faithful. You never had to wonder if they were going to take advantage of you. You knew that they loved you unconditionally. It didn't matter what you did. When you walked in, it was not going to change how you got treated by them. That they accepted you, that they would forgive you. No, you know, imagine you were in a relationship where you knew all of that was true. Would you have any concern, any concern, about turning around and putting them before you? Well, of course you wouldn't. Because there's so much love and security in that relationship, it is a safe place for you to do that. And this is all Paul's getting at. How about you create that kind of environment in your marriage relationship where you defer, you defer, you defer back and forth. Now, if you don't want to take that approach, then my question to you would be, what is your alternative? I mean, what's your plan? You want to be in a relationship where you have to watch your back with the person you're married to? You want to be in a relationship where you got to look out for yourself and make sure they don't take advantage of you? And if they do, you got to figure out how to take advantage of them to even the score? I mean, of course you don't want to be in a relationship like that. You know what happens when you're in relationships like that? Some of you, you know exactly what happens. You've been there. That is a relationship built on fear and insecurity. And do you know what fear and insecurity do? If you're not confident they're always going to put you before themselves, you've got every right to be afraid. But do you know what fear and insecurity do? They undermine intimacy, which is why those couples are never happy together forever. Those couples can't stay in love because fear doesn't allow it. But you put two people together who practice mutual submission, oh, there's no fear in that kind of love. That kind of love drives out any fear that you may have. So, what do you do with this? Well, for those of us, uh, for those of you, excuse me, in the room who you're not married, but you hope to be married one day, got great news for you. You know one of the secrets, and you can start practicing now. And you have to practice because this is not natural. So my suggestion to you would be go out this week and figure out how do I start practicing putting other people before myself? Because it is a skill that you have to develop. So develop it. Work on it. Practice it before you're married so when you get married, you got a better marriage. And by the way, if you are currently in a dating relationship, this is a part where you're just going to want to ignore me and that's fine. But if you're currently in a dating relationship with somebody who does not practice this right now, you probably want to get out of that relationship. And I don't have to know them, and they're not bad people, and I'm not trying to be mean. But the reason I say that, and you don't have to believe me, just catch a married person around you afterwards and ask them. The reason I say that is because they will not get better at it when you say, I do. Nothing gets better when you say, I do, okay? It all gets harder. Because you're in the relationship now, so you don't put your best foot forward anymore. So... This may help you figure out who you want to spend forever with. You better look for this quality. Now, 
for all of us who are married, guess what? You made your bed, you have to lay in it. You're stuck, okay? You're stuck. That's okay, though, because you can start practicing this right now in your marriage relationship. And if you're thinking, oh, no, I am not doing that because if I do that, I know what they're like and they're going to take advantage of me and it's going to be, okay, fine. But listen, you know what it takes for two people to submit to one another? It takes one person to go first. It takes one person to go first. And yeah, maybe they don't respond in kind. But what if they do? What if they do? Somebody has to go first. And besides, if you don't go first, what's going to happen? You're going to keep having the relationship you currently have. Things will not get better. So what if you had the courage to go first? To go first. And to say, I'm going to put you before me, you before me, you before me. This is, for those of us who are Jesus followers, we should know how to do this. This is what he has done and continues to do for us. He modeled the way. He sets an example. He showed us how to do it. And so Paul says, let's do it with everybody. Submit to one another. Let's do it with everybody. But by all means, start right there in your marriage and make it a submission competition. Let me pray for us. Father, this is way harder to do than it is to talk about. But would you help you know, those who are single, who are thinking about marriage in the future, would you, would you give them the wisdom to be able to practice this now, to develop these skills now, to look for this in the person that they're going to be with one day forever? And for those of us who are married, would you give us the courage to take the first step, to be the first one to defer, to be the first one to put the other person first and to just see what happens as we begin to treat our spouses the way you treat us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.